Welcome back, friend, members of the Attleboro Historic Preservation Society. It's good to be back, and I'm Barbara Kramer and I are substituting for Rachel Killian, who would have been conducting this meeting, and um, has brought some artifacts that people have sent to the Historic Society. So we're hoping that all you people have something to share so that we don't, and then we'll have a walk around the table and questions or whatever. Just an update, um, I know people are probably wondering what's happening with the Academy and the Arbor Historic Preservation Society is hoping that soon we will be going into the Academy building. Brian French and Marion Ridington presented um, a report to the Attleboro City Council, and that's where all the information is now Six. waiting for, I think her, her name is Reynolds, uh, who is the committee person for the building and what's going to happen. But keep our fingers crossed, because we know that um, I've approached the mayor, these people have approached the mayor, and soon, we hope, we'll hear that the Academy is now our home and that we can go in there and restore and do all the things that are necessary so then we can have our meetings and have school classes in there and do so many fun things that we have been waiting for. And if you hear a rumbling, you'll know that Evelyn Silva, <laughs> who was here and I mean, 13, 14 years ago, it was Evelyn who said, okay, we need to get into that academy, the school building, and make it ours. And so we've done a lot of work. Um, when um, Leper, John Leper was with the state, he did some things for us and had um, a lot of renovation done. So many people have been involved and we've had fundraiser after fundraiser and people have made donations. So keep your fingers crossed and say soon, please, soon. I'm going to start with something before I call on people who have brought their um, memories or pictures or whatever you might have. But um, Rachel received this picture of, um, a donated by James Scott, or Scott James, she said. He was wa wanting information um, more, so later when you come to look at it. However, there was a list of names, and it's elementary graduates in Attleboro. Oh. And it, all elementary schools participated. The year was 1922. Oh. So that's why I was saying, OK, here we are, 2022, yes. and it is over 100 years. I looked through the names, and I'm going to put them out there so some of you may recognize. But one of the names that I came across immediately was Cyril Kevin Brennan. <laughs> Cyril K. Brennan was our mayor in Attleboro. I, don't, I couldn't find him, but I mean, some people might recognize him immediately. And also, as I'm looking through the list of uh, names, was my mother's oldest brother. Her brother, she was a Madden, and there was Howard Lewis Madden, and he was an eighth grade graduate as well. And it's, it's so interesting to look at how well-dressed all of them are, and the men, the boys, the young boys are all in suit coats and ties, of course, holding their graduation uh, diplomas. So again, I just thought this was something to begin our Very nice. history of Attleboro. Yeah. So that's here. So there's someone who'd like to start sharing with us. My name is Jim Kepler, and I live on Newport Avenue and uh, in the Thomas Tingley House. And I am proud to say that I am the first recipient of the Historical Society's plaque program. Very excited. 
So, thank you. Uh, I would have come to more of these meetings, except I didn't retire until last December, so now I have time to show up. Um, so, the story behind this object here is I decided some years ago to dig a garden right outside of my kitchen. And I dug it down about a good 12 inches because I really wanted, I needed to amend the soil and the soil was horrible. And I dug this up. Before I say that, I should tell you that the history of the house, uh, Thomas Tingley and his family were stonemasons and they are responsible for many of the gravestones in the Newell burying ground. In fact, they had a quarry across the street from me uh, where they quarried most of their stonework. Uh, as business grew, they actually moved to, they expanded the province. But many of the gravestones, if you look at them on the bottom, it's signed Tingley and Sons. So there I was digging a foot down um, in my thing, and I came across this piece of slate that said Sick Transit GL. And of course, thanks to the internet, um, you can look this up pretty quickly. And it's, it's a very sort of a famous quote called Sick, Sick Transit Gloria Mundi. And the, it's a Latin phrase and it basically means thus passes the glory of the world. Sick Transit Gloria Mundi. It was used as a ritual for popes apparently when each pope was installed. Although when I looked it up years ago, one of the descriptions was it was really a snarky comment from one pope to another, like, uh, there goes the glory of the world. So I don't know which is true. Um, but apparently it's a very popular term, uh, including Emily Dickinson's first poem that she, that was published without her permission, was titled, Sick Transit, Gloria Mundi. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea how old this is. It, if you look at it closely, it obviously was hand done. Uh, you know, I dug a pretty large garden. It was the only piece I came across. So I have no idea. Um, and that's it. I've, and oh, my last thing was I did, I remember years ago when I was looking up all the descriptions, my favorite one was from the Urban Dictionary, was Gloria got sick on the bus on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. Thank you. Well, I came to Attleboro uh, in 1949. I was just out of college and I had an offer for teaching in Attleboro where I'd never been before. So my father drove me down, must have been Labor Day, because school started Wednesday. So he dropped me off and uh, in those days, I had no car of my own or phone or anything. We found at Bliss School, the superintendent, he was doing paperwork and this was Labor Day. Nobody was around. I didn't know where I was going to stay. I had a suitcase and some stuff for school. Um, unbelievable what people did in the old days. Anyway, so I got a room on County Street with Mrs. Perry. Her son was Bob Perry, who was one of the former uh, owner, not the owner, but the leader of the YMCA. So that was Bob Perry. So I stayed with his mother, and at night, I had breakfast there, you know, my own, but I had to, at night to go up, uptown. And the only place that you could eat in those days was Bobby's Restaurant. Does, does that ring a bell with anybody? Oh, Bobby's. 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 Yeah. Today, today, that's where the old Bank Street hardware was. Mm -hmm. So I would walk up, you know, through storm and rain and snow alone, and every night I would eat in the little restaurant. It was called the Peacock. And I was looking up today, uh, Bobby started that restaurant when he was only 16 years old. Oh, His father, whatever, so whatever. So that, that was it, and I'd eat alone. And then next door was like a ice cream shop and the kids would come there after school and have their treats and so forth. So um, that was... Uh, so, so where did you end up staying that night? <laughs> oh, I st stayed on County Street. Oh, yes. 147 County Street was right near the old high school, which was Brennan and now it's what, alternative or something. Yeah. Yep. So, mm -hmm. so it was a little hike to come up, but the, the railroad station was there. So weekends I would go into Boston 
and then go to my fiance's house in Cambridge. So I, I was not here weekends, but a friend I went to college with lived over in Elizabeth Street. Her father was the owner of an Interborough Laundry it was by Coogan's. You know Jerry Coogan, the lawyer? Oh, yeah. Well, that was, he was one of the younger members of Miss, Mrs. Mrs. Coogan. Uh, she, at Tuesday night, she'd have me over, so I'd walk from County to Elizabeth Street, to Elizabeth, yeah. Elizabeth Street. Yeah. and now we, my husband and I, between he wasn't there with me, but from when we bought a house, it was on Fourth uh, uh, Street. Okay. Before that, we lived on John Street, and then we then we were 70 years at Hodges Street. So all in, all in the same. It's amazing when you come in to a city and you, you think, well, I'll be here for a while, and here it was <laughs> 70 years ago. So, but uh, but the corner of Park Street now, where the bank is, that was Woolworths. And across the street from that was Brown's Dress Shop, and it was owned by the Conleys. Mm -hmm. So they were all, all local here. And there were three shoe stores. Three shoe stores. Three shoe right. stores. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and a little bit into that was London's. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was Floyd's. And so there were shops. Sure. But you know, where are they now? Whatever. Silvans and Coughlin's. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and there were two markets, one on one side. A street and one on the other, and there was a hotel, an old kind of old-time ho hotel there. So, so that was that was the Attleboro that I came to in those days. So. That's very nice. That's great. I'm going to play hit or miss here because when she was talking, something came to my memory. A former member of the Historic Society was Jenny Wall. Jenny Wall was, would come to our meetings here with her, uh, with her son, Fred Wall, and they were always here for every program we had and very supportive of the Historic Society. But before that, I knew Jenny because she worked in the Studley School cafeteria. I was a teacher at Studley School, but I wasn't in the main building because there wasn't room for the third grade. There were three third grades, so they put a portable building. It looked like a tr big trailer, and that was in the parking lot. And of course, we didn't have an intercom system. We didn't have techies and phones, all that business. So when it was time for the third graders to go to lunch, I, my class, there were three classes in that building. Um, the name Hope Spatcher might mean something to you. She was another one of the teachers. And, but my room faced the cafeteria wall. And Jenny would come to the window, and she would wave a white towel or a napkin. And that was the thing I knew about what time we would be going for lunch. And so Jenny would be waving that frantically. And then I'd say, OK, third graders, we're now going to lunch. And we would march out of the building, go around, come in the back door into the cafeteria. And that was. It just had such fond memories of Jenny doing that, waving her towel or her napkin. And she had a special place in her heart for third graders because she would ask the teachers and the students, what would, those were the days when they cooked in the cafeteria. They made lunches. They weren't bought lunches or service that were made ahead of time and um, at the high school and brought over to the schools. So I had just that fond memory, and when Jean was talking about Attleboro and whatever, I had to share that with you. And I know Jenny is probably looking down, smiling. Maybe she's got a white cloth up yeah. there, who knows, <laughs> as an angel, right. So, yes. And one of my favorites that Jenny made was mac and cheese, but it wasn't just plain mac and cheese. She made it especially for the teachers with tomato in it. And so she would say, okay, um, 
you can have yours while you're monitoring the class, eating their lunch. So it was a great memory. Thank you. I moved here in 1972, and I bought the home that was built by Betty's mother. And dad, right? Over, yep, the Nickets. Yep, over right. on Hatch Road off Clifton. Right. Still there. Go ahead. Wonderful in front of home. That mic. Yes, okay. I have a question. Um, I was a, a friend, Ariel Hall. Oh, seriously. She was a Perry. And I think you, who was it? Yeah, you mentioned a Perry. And I understand that Ariel, she told me that she grew up in the home that's now Blackington Inn. That was the Perry home. And her family had a men's clothing store that was right next to Milady's. Yeah, I, I, I boots I bought there when they closed. Yeah, wonderful old stores in Attleboro. So Ariel grew up in that, it was the Perry home, is that true, do you remember? Now the Blackington Inn, of course, it was bought by Withers, Mr. Withers originally, and then the um, Can Can Canova family now yes. owns it. And I understand that uh, Gary Demers bought the um, Nobby Crafter. I love Nobby Crafters. I bought some buttons and things for various organizations. They were wonderful organizations. So I haven't lived here that much, but I do appreciate Attleboro. It's really a great city. Um, and Cape Ron Park is just such a gem. <laughs> and the zoo. Um, <laughs> I must say, Ariel Hall was the narrator for the shows that Russ Marchand used to do. Do you remember? He was a retired science teacher, I believe. Yeah. He yes, taught, didn't yes, he teach yes, it yes. in Idleboro? Russ Marchand, bless him. He would, he would travel around the world photographing gardens. And then he had these shows, and he, took, he traveled across country with this slideshow. He had three screens, three projectors, and he put together this sl seamless slideshow <laughs> of the gardens, and he also put music to it, classical, beautiful music, and Ariel Perry Hall narrated. She had the most beautiful voice. Um, very, very, and, and for, she sounded almost English. She was very well educated. She was a harpist, actually. Mm -hmm. She played in the Rainbow Room in New York City, oh. which is at Rockefeller Center, I believe. She wrote a book, too. She did? I didn't know that. She gave her some of her books to Wheaton College Library, where, where I worked till 1995. And, um, and she was a good friend of Mabel Woolley, also in Attleboro, no? no? Mabel, her home was over on 123, just beyond Washington Plaza, that area. And they were friends of Gertrude Martin, I don't know, she was from Attleboro, her nickname was Book. She was the fine arts librarian at Wheaton College for many years, wonderful, wonderful woman. Well, that's my Thank you, very nice. It was supposed to be all things Attleboro, so I looked around my house to see what I had that would say Attleboro on it. So I brought some of my collection of souvenir china. Um, this is one piece. That's made out of custard glass, and that's a toothpick. They used to call it a toothpick, and they would have it on their tables, and the toothpicks would go in it. And it says right on it, souvenir of Attleboro, Massachusetts. I don't know if you can read it on there, but it does say that right on it. Does and, it have an age on that? Um, well, I tried to date it because of the fact that the Attleboro is spelled B-O-R-O, oh. um, and it didn't really work for me. This souvenir china was all kind of popular um, between the 1880s and 1920s, and people in different communities would request you know, things, and it, they would be made in Germany or England, where a lot of china was made. And uh, you could send pictures over there, and they would put it on a piece of dishware or, or china and send it back and it would say Attleboro Mass on it. Um, but we officially dropped the O-U-G-H in 1915 when we became a city and so we are legally O-R-O. -R -O. Right. All these other towns there are boroughs and it, they just got O-R-O. -R -O. I heard once that there was only two or three towns in Massachusetts that are legally just O-R-O -R -O, and everybody else is just dropping the O-U-G-H but yes. anyway or the U-G-H. So anyway, so this is a toothpick that they would have had on their tables. Then this is a little um, picture that I got. I think I, I bought that at an Attleboro yard sale, and I think I got this 
at an Attleboro yard sale too. Um, this is a piece of china that says Germany on it, and it was a crema, so it was, uh, you know, just used for cream. And this is another creamer. I bought this in an uh, antique shop in, in Foxborough. And that says Atterboro Mass on it. And it also says Germany on the bottom. Um, and I have this, which isn't a piece of souvenir china, but I, found, I bought this at a yard sale in Atterboro. And you can see that it's a medicine bottle. I should turn it this way, I guess. It says M. Me, um, pharmacist, Atterboro Mass. And so I looked in my, um, I don't want to turn, lay it down because it might leak. That's just food coloring in there. Yeah, when I bought it, it didn't have any stuff in it. But anyway, <laughs> but it said Attleboro on it, so that's why I had to get it. But I did look in my 1897 city directory and a 1905 city directory, and they said that Marshall Mead was a registered pharmacologist, and his store was at 37 Park Street, and he lived at 137 Pleasant Street. And then this one... I bought at um, the old bowling alley over off the uh, Speedway. Everybody knows what I mean when I say Speedway. Um, Tony's, yes, Tony's. Tony has a yard sale there every so many weeks or whatever. And this is a piece of pottery. And this is just gorgeous to me. It says 1914 Atterboro, Mass. And then it says the new high school. And, it sh it shows the high school. and then if you flip it over, it says San Susie's. Does everybody remember San Susie's? Yes. Yeah, on, on Park Street, it was a clothing store. And that says 1889, so that must have been the date for San Susie's because the picture below that is the library, the public library. Oh, nice. And that wasn't built, that's, that's 1908 or something. But um, yeah, isn't that cute? That is huge. Tony had it in a case, and I don't think he really wanted to sell it, but I bought it in. <laughs> <laughs> you made the price. Yeah, good. He, he's good to me, though. But anyway, does anybody know what th this is? Pinbox. No, it's, no? Wow, nobody? It's got a cover, and it's got a little hole in the top. None of you ladies know what this is? Wow, I'm surprised. It's called a hair receiver. And I'll put it down here again. Um, it's called a hair receiver, and every morning when you brushed your hair, if it got on your shoulders or whatever, you'd pick it off and you'd stick it in this little hole in the top of this on your bureau. It was part of a dresser set, you know, like you'd have your comb and your brush and your mirror and a hair receiver. And so then when you wanted to uh, make something like a pin cushion, you would just go to your hair receiver and take out the hair and stuff it in your pin cushion to, you know, or whatever else they use extra hair for, I don't really know. But the funniest part of this, and everybody's gonna laugh now, I've had this for 40 years, I bought. I bought it at an um, antique shop in Mansfield. And 40 years ago, that was my hair. Yeah. And this is my hair now. Yes, yes. Look at that. Oh, wow. Marion, yep. that's yep. great. Yep. Oh, I, um, I, I can't believe it myself that my hair's that different. <laughs> but anyway. OK, and then I got one more. And this is, everybody recognizes this. Oh, yes. That's our academy. Yes. And I bought that at an antique show in Taunton in a hotel. And I paid dearly for that, let me tell you. Um, but I wanted it. You know, I'm very close to the academy. And, and um, Ruth Nerney and I were the ones that filled out all of uh, uh, paperwork to have that put on the National Register of Historic Places. But anyway, so it, it has Germany on the back of it, but the people in these towns used to send um, the uh, pictures of their buildings over to the um, factories in Germany and England, like I said, and they would put them on there and, and send them back. So, and when we went before the council, like um, Betty was talking about, to talk about the academy, I took this with me and passed it around to the whole city council so all of them could see how, how much the academy meant to people in Attleboro, even way back then. Yes, so, very good. Anyway. So that's my story. Wonderful. Very nice. I'm going to uh, just mention a couple things. When, when school came up, um, one of the pictures that Rachel had received in the mail was a picture, a class picture, 
of a group of students, and, it, and in the reading it said that this picture was um, of a 1950 class, and that a student, oh, excuse me, thank you, thank you, right? A student by the name of David Hansen was at this school, but he said he didn't say the school, a name that we would recognize. He said it was the Tilton School, and that was incorrect. It was Farmer's School. How many of you know where Farmer's School is? Right? It's a dentist now. And Farmer's School originally was on North Avenue. Two, was it? No, no. The original Farmer's School was. It was in where Farmer's School is now, was moved to North Africa. That's right. Okay. See, and I stand so corrected. the second building that was Farmer's School. Right. The first one had um, new, uh, some kind of a disease that was spreading, and that, that's why they decided they didn't want it to be a school anymore. Oh. So right. They threw it on some was logs. Was it diphtheria and, or? Yeah, diphtheria, I think. Right. That's what it was. Yes. They threw it on some logs and pulled it down the road with some oxen around. Uh, onto North Avenue and it's two houses down from me and when you look at it you can tell it's a school because one side is the girls do door and the other side is the, the boys door. door right and, um, and then they built this one on the same spot now um, in Rachel's um, piece that she received from this gentleman it says that um, David Hansen is listed in the 1950 um, census, at, he lived at 45 Upland Road, which is, uh, we know as Mortgage Hill, um, any of you who have been uh, living in Attleboro for years. And um, it says here that he, he was four years old, and at the time frame looks about right. But when I look at this picture, I would say these kids were older than four years. Um, to me, they might have been first graders or second graders, and, um, and the farmer school. I didn't recognize, and there aren't any names listed except for this fellow who said it was the Tilton School, but that's incorrect. David so Hansen was an eye doctor. He was, yes. His father before him was right. Um, so David Hansen, as Marion just said, was an eye doctor, and so was his father before him. So. Um, I'll leave the, uh, the picture also up at the uh, table when we have our tour of the artifacts. Okay. Anyone else? My mother, the, her older sister, moved from the wilds of Vermont <laughs> to Attleboro because you met her husband here. And then my mother, who lived in Windsor, Vermont, uh, right about 1940, her sister said, come down and live with me. So she did. She worked at D.E. Makepeace Company. And my aunt and uncle, Sue and Joe, they bought a house. They didn't live on Round's Place at the time, though. They lived on uh, Veery Road in a little apartment on Veery oh, Road. Right yeah, across uh, Mortgage Hill right. East. Mortgage Hill East, across North Main Street. But yeah, and my mother came down and she lived with my aunt and her, and her husband uh, on Rounds Place. She met my father, and as they say, the rest is history. But Rounds Place, one thing I got to tell you, they had water whenever they, it rained. It, they had water in the cellar. My uncle worked at St. Regis Sisal Craft. It was a paper company here. And he would bring these, these, um, these wooden crates and wooden, um, what do you call them? You stack things on. I'm, yeah, I'm having a senior pallets. moment. Pallets, wooden pallets, and he put them all in his basement, so it was raised up like two pallets high, so that the water wouldn't get on anything. But I remember as a kid, it was a great place to go in the rain because the water would come right out of that stream. You could go play in that water. You know, he had weeping willow trees. I mean, everything you'd ever think of in his little garage there. But yeah, my. My, my Aunt Sue, Sue Roy, who happened to be a school teacher, another school teacher, who worked at uh, St. John's School for 25 years. Not a, not a nun, a lay teacher. And people would say, I remember her. She was awfully nice for St. John's School. <laughs> she was, she was a good woman. So that's my little history of Round's Play. <laughs> Thank you.
Marion has something else, so of course we do. <laughs> Betty told me to bring it just in case nobody brought anything, but you did well, so anyway. <laughs> but I love to tell this story, and I've already told it to you, some of you people anyway, but you can listen to it again. Back in 2020, I went to City Hall to check the mail for the Historical Commission, and there was this big envelope, and it was from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and inside was two samplers, and they were in very poor condition. They were full of holes, and a lot of the, the thread was missing and everything. But I, I um, opened it up and started reading what this lady had written. She said, I've been, I don't know if this will work here or not. Maybe it's too big. Can you back it up or something? No. Oh, okay. 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 Um, the letter said that she found these samplers when she was cleaning out her grandmother's stuff. The COVID had just started, and so everybody was going through their stuff at home and everything. And so she was going to throw them out. And you can see this holes in them and a lot of the threads are missing and everything. But she saw the words Capron and Attleboro on the samplers. So she could remember coming to Attleboro when she was a little girl and uh, to visit her grandmother. And they would take her to Capron Park. So she decided to send them back to Attleboro and told me I could do whatever I wanted to with them. So anyway, I started looking at them. This is, this is the other one. They're, they're kind of similar, but they're two. They're done by two little girls, two different little girls. One was um, nine and the other one was 11 when they did them. And they were done in 1820. Wow. And I got them in 2020. So they were 200 years old. 200 years old, I'm starting to shake. <laughs> because after I really started studying them, I realized they were made in my house. 200 years before that, oh and they came back to my house. Oh my Two little girls, Abby Capron and Horatia Capron, were sisters. They had 12 kids. You know, everybody back then had 12 kids. Hmm. And, um, <laughs> but anyway, but the mothers used to have to teach the kids. The, the little boys were allowed to go to school, but the little girls were supposed to stay home and learn how to sew and cook. But those ingenious little New England mothers taught the girls how to do this uh, sewing by giving them samplers to make. And doing the samplers, you always see the alphabet and the numbers. Yeah. So they were doing their math and English at the same time, and they usually always have Bible verses on them or poetry or whatever. So that was their schooling, and those, those New England mothers knew how to get it into the little girls yeah. as well as the little boys at school. But these two girls were um, two of J Jacob and Deborah's kids, and um, they came home 200 years later. Wow, how nice. Yeah. I was only 20 years old when I started teaching. My re recollection of driving into Attleboro was like liquor stores and churches. <laughs> <laughs> I remember there were a lot of liquor stores and a lot of churches. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love Attleboro. I can't even imagine ever leaving. So. What? No, that wasn't me. I went to Tiffany with Desiree Piguet. Anybody remember Desiree Piguet? Um, and I, my, my interview was at the academy with um, Sam, Sam Thomas. And he was an interesting character, Sam Thomas. And you know how nervous you are for your first interview? You know, he asked me one question that legitimately had anything to do with the classroom. And I hope I'm not offending any of our viewers. But he asked me, what would you do if the kid threw up? <laughs> that was the one question that he asked me. I got the job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so this was sent to us, a letter opener from A.S. Ingram Company. Do people remember A.S. Ingram? So he said the building was constructed in 1908. And so I think it's hard to see, but there are some images of Attleboro on one side. There's some pictures, images right along here. That's the factory. And then the other side is A.S. Ingram and Company. Jewel, jewelry and novelties. Right. 
Ingraham. So now, does anybody have any history about the Ingraham family of people? They bought my house in 1801 and they built an extension and lived there for 150 years. Wow, okay. So. Lemuel Ingraham is the original owner. You know what? I think Attleboro is the smallest city I've ever been in. Everybody is connected. Somehow, there yeah. are constant connections in Attleboro. It's interesting. When we complete this um, tour, I, mean, I want you to come to the table because there are other things on the table that have been. Rachel has been um, sent many articles, papers, pictures in the, in the mail. So she has made the collection. And hopefully, when we are in the academy, we'll have exhibits and a lot of this that has all anything to do with Attleboro will be on display. And one of the things that she received, which I thought was unique to Attleboro, it's music. And it was called the Attleboro Waltz. And it was by Arthur Nielsen. And Arthur Nielsen was a music teacher in Attleboro, and he wrote and published his own music. And this was sent by his family, and they said they understand that um, the copy of this would be appropriate to the Attleboro Historic Preservation Society. Mm -hmm. So Rachel received that. As, as she has received many pictures, postcards, um, but we have a lot of that here on the table that we haven't displayed. Rachel had said, too. She doesn't read music or whatever, <laughs> but she said it was unique, and especially being called the Oliver Waltz. Um, I would imagine that um, maybe because of Mr. Nielsen being um, an Attleboro music teacher, that other people before him or after him have um, maybe played the music or, anyway, that was unique to Attleboro. This <laughs> was sent to Rachel. It's a bottle of sparkling, um, Pepsi. it's Coca-Cola, but it's Pepsi, and it was made in Attleboro, Mass. And I don't know whether it was bottled by a cola bottling company, Attleboro, Mass. It was on oh. Dennis Street. It was on Dennis Street, yes. And also, now, this was in this box with, with the uh, soda bottle. But anyway, I did not know what it was. To me, it was a, a shoehorn. Yes. But Marion explained to me why it has this little opening. I'm going to put it down here. We got that? OK. And she said you would put your shoelaces through that. Well, you put that through the eye, eye your sneakers, sneakers whatever, yeah. and then put the shoelace through that big hole and be able and to right. pull it back. And be able to pull it back. So, and that was also, um, what was it here? Uh, since I don't have my glasses on, oh, let's put it down and see what it says. No? Nope. Yeah, these are cheetahs. <coughs> oh, can you use those? Thank you. That's what I have. You'd lose your boots that would be laced all the way up. Okay, the it says Angels Attleboro. I came from Angels Attleboro, best shoe repaired, <laughs> uh, like a cobbler, yes. I would s assume, from Angels. I have no, it doesn't give any street address or anything, but that's where it was from. Uh -huh. Right. So the, some of the Artifacts that are sent to Rachel are unique, and but because something like this that was made at Clear Float, Clear Float, yeah. Clear Float, and another one that was made from Clear Float, a lot of that. And I thought we had um, <laughs> now this very heavy brick. It's too heavy for me, but it, believe it or not, does anybody know? Except Marion, she knows. <laughs> Anybody know what it is? Tie it to a horse's rein, keep it from moving. <laughs> no. Is it a window? Is it a horse stop? It's no. Nope. I 
about to heat your bed. Yeah. Ah, she's warm, uh, right? It's a foot warmer, yeah. right? And it is heavy. Right. So I guess you'd heat it up at the fireplace you or put whatever. It in the coals in the fireplace. In the coals. It's made out of soapstone, which holds its heat very long, I guess. Right. And then you could um, use it to. Uh, you could even take it in your wagon if you're going to church or something. It would keep your feet warm, and then you could take right. it into church with you because there was no heat. Oh, in right. The, exactly. They used to bring right. the dogs with them because the dog's body heat would help right. warm their feet. <laughs> um, but it, they were very common and cheap and easy to make, you know. So, as I, as I said, um, Rachel said, which she knew she wasn't going to be here, she had to go to Iowa to a fun family funeral. Anyway, but she brought all this stuff to my house and said, okay, look through it, you and Barbara look through it, and um, whatever you deem that you'd like to show people or tell them, go ahead, she said, because she just has kept all this stuff in her house, or she brings it up to the, um, the office at yeah. the library, mm -hmm. and some of the things that she said, but we'll, they will be eventually in the academy, Very hoping good. soon. So um, those are some of the things. But I would like you to come and look at the table. One of the um, items, and I was hoping that he was able to get here this evening, Bob Dyan. How many know Bob Dyan? He was a policeman here in Attleboro. And he had, well, they are now, Bob is now moving in with his son, Tom. And so Tom told me that they have tried to put all, all the stuff that his dad has accumulated <laughs> under the bed, in the closets, everywhere. The, his scrapbook is here. And he actually um, has taken items from the Attleboro newspaper and made this huge scrapbook. And it's, of course, it's all about Attleboro. <laughs>